Hi, Internet Grandpa here, and today we're going to do our third reading from the book The Door and the Wall. Please reach down, click like, and subscribe. That tells YouTube you like these sorts of videos, and I'll put more of them in your feed. Now, let's begin. June passed, and the days lengthened into summer. The plague had died out, but with it going went many of the people of London, even some of the monks. Once more, the monastery kept its usual round of service to God and humanity. The monks who were left added to their own the duties of those who had died. Brother Luke sometimes helped in the preparation of food. Sometimes he carried Robin down into the kitchen, where he could be warm on a wet day. It was there that he finished the little cross. Although it is yet too soon for thee to carve figures for choir stalls or for bosses for ch chapel, a child's puppet could be made more easily. Why not make one for the poor girl child who hung to my skirts that day? She dwelleth by Houndsditch in a poor hovel where I go on my errands. A girl's plaything? said Robin. Then he began to think what fun it might be to carve out a face. He might even make the arms and legs so they would move. Yes, he said, I will. So began the making of the doll for the little girl. Head and body were to be in one piece, with arms and legs jointed. Brother Matthew will help thee to work that out, said Brother Luke. Soft pine again was used, because it was easier to cut. Robin became so excited at seeing real features emerge from the piece of wood that he could hardly bear to take time to attend to his studies. Reading went well, and he was beginning to make fair characters in writing with the quill. On clear nights, Brother Hubert took him to a high tower of the monastery to tell him of the stars. He told Robin, too, of far countries the holy land where crusaders had fought for the tomb of our Lord, and of the Greece and Rome, whose ancient languages were the beginnings of many other tongues. He told of Roman legions who had come to Britain centuries before, and of Saxon and Danish kings who in turn had ruled their land. Robin couldn't always remember which ones came first, but he liked to hear Brother Hubert tell about them. One day, Robin was sitting in the trundle cart, finishing the child's doll, when Brother Luke came into the garden. Thy hands are well used to the chisel now, he said, in praise of Robin's work. That is a face and body right enough, and I see thou art attaching the arms. Will they move then? Yes, said Robin. See how this peg fits into the shoulder that slips into the top of the arm, and it swings. See? It will make a little child very happy, said the friar. Now, because the day is so fine, and thou art getting so strong, it might be well if we should go fishing. Fishing? Could he really leave the hospice and go fishing? Even the fun of fitting arms and legs to the doll could not keep Robin from wanting to get out into the fields and away from bench and bed, stool and trundle cart. I could sit against a tree and fish too, thank you. No doubt, agreed Brother Luke. Come then. He lifted Robin to his back, and they went down the green to the brook outside the walls. They fished for a time, each catching several trout which they wrapped in leaves. The sun shone warm through the leafy grove. Insects droned in the noon heat, and the water slipped musically over the green mossed stones. It was very still. Suddenly the quiet was burst with the shout of boys' voices. Six or seven urchins ran over the green, stripping off clothes as they came. Robin looked over his shoulder at Joffrey Atwater, the same lad who had first seen limping through the corridors of St. Mark's. Joffrey raced down the bank ahead of all the rest, swinging his crutches ahead of him and taking in his stride twice as much ground as the other boys. Joffrey saw Robin in the same moment. Hi, Crookshanks, he called. Art finding fish for thy fasting? 
Off came the last ragged garment, down went the crutches, and with a whoosh, he was into the water with the others and away with the current. Thrashing arms and legs beating the water into foam and spoiling the fishing. Robin wished with all his heart that he could go into the water and swim too. But it was all very well for Brother Luke to bring him fishing, but it only seemed to make it harder that he couldn't run about or swim like the other boys. The friar saw Robin's hungry look. Off with thy jerkin, he said at the same time, rising and taking off his own habit. We'll give thee a good bath and cleanse thy humor. Who knows? Mayhap we can teach thee to swim. He pulled off Robin's hosen and carried him into the water, holding and dipping him where the current ran deep. Now swing thy arm about with fingers closed to push the water back. Robin pushed and felt himself moving along with Brother Luke walking and supporting him. All the troubles of the past months seemed to float away with the running of the brook and strength and power to flow into his arms. It was wonderful. Brother Luke didn't allow him to stay long in the water, but promised to bring him every day. For some time I have had this in mind, he said. Now I know I was right. This will make thine arms even stronger, and soon they will help thee to get about on land as well. How? asked Robin. But even as he said it, he knew what Brother Luke meant. Crutches. That was it. With crutches, he would be able to go about as Joffrey did. He could play at duck on a rock with the boys. He could join them in hoodman and blink or hide and seek. Crutches would be almost as much fun as stilts. Then Robin remembered that his father expected him to be a knight. How could he ride horseback in chain mail while his legs were bent and he had to use crutches? How could he face his father? How bear his mother's pitying look? How would they feel to have a son who would not fulfill his knightly duties? I see thou hast my meaning, said the friar, as he finished dressing Robin. Crutches or crosses, as thou'lt have it, tis all the same thing. Remember, even thy crutches can be a door and a wall. By the time they are made, thou wilt be ready for them, God willing. Up now and hold fast whilst we go up the hill. From that day forward, swimming became a part of Robin's everyday life. Besides reading, writing, and study of history and the stars, Robin was given certain duties in the routine of the church. At the lectern during rehearsals, he turned the pages of the Missal, a book of music notes large enough for all the brothers to see as they stood in the chantry. Each day, too, he worked with Brother Matthew in the carpentry shop. He liked the music and the carpentry better than the reading and writing, but best of all, he liked the swimming. It made him feel free and powerful. Even on cloudy or rainy days, when the weather was quite cool, Robin was taken for his daily swim, and soon he was able to dive beneath the water and play tricks on the good friar. Once, when the boys saw Robin's little boat, they begged to be allowed to sail it too but they were all so eager to try it that soon its rigging was broken and its pennant dragging. So Robin helped each of them make a boat of their own. Joffrey's was made from a piece of the willow overhanging the brook. A twig stuck into a wormhole made the mast. Another twig threw a leaf served for a sail. Then Dickon must have one. Then Alfred and the swimming home became a boat yard. Sometimes, they marked out squares in the sandy bank and played a game of checkers with round stones. Sometimes on hot days, all the time was spent in the water, and the boys raced Robin to the weir and back. Once, Robin beat them all. Crookshanks here is as fast as any of us, Joffrey said proudly. And then, Robin felt as if he were one of them. Once, when Robin dived underwater and hid in the rushes, Brother Luke at first scolded him, for he was frightened. Then he said, But I am glad for thy mischief, for it is a sign thou art well. Robin had another reason for knowing he was well, but he kept it a secret. 
work was begun on the crutches. They were to be simple, straight staves with cross pieces at the top to fit under Robin's arm. Brother Matthew had found the wood of proper kind and size when he sawed it the right length, allowing a little for finishing. Brother Luke wheeled Robin to the shed where he could watch. When the first piece of wood was put into the vise and Brother Matthew began to draw the spokeshave down the length of it, Robin thought it time to tell his secret, for he wanted very much to have a hand in making the crutches with which he hoped to walk. Can I shape the pieces, thank you, he asked. Look, he directed, I can bear my weight upon my feet, though I cannot stand long alone, nor can I straighten, but can I not lean upon the bench? To the surprise of both brothers, Robin hitched along slowly toward Brother Matthew's workbench, where he leaned for a few moments before he found it necessary to sit down. Now praise our Lord of mercy, said Brother Luke fervently, at the same time putting forth a high stool for Robin to sit on. Now twill thy own crutches thou wilt wear made by thy own hand. Brother Matthew blessed him to show how grateful he was and arranged the work so that Robin could better attend to it for himself. It was more exciting to work on a real bench, to draw the sharp knife along the clean wood, to hear it snick as the knife took hold and then slither off into shavings. The oak was very hard and took real strength to work, but swimming had given Robin good muscles in his arms so that little by little he was able to shape the staff. Several weeks went by before Robin finished the crutches, but at last they were done, and he could hardly wait to try them. There should be padding and leather on the cross pieces, said Brother Luke. Let us go into the city, to the pouchmaker's guild. I have errands for the prior as well. Besides, it is Midsummer's Eve. We shall see the gaiety. Shall I walk then, asked Robin, for look you, I've been trying the crutches already and can go at a good pace. See you? Robin slid off the stool, fitted the crutches under his arms, and was off across the garth, all in one motion. Softly, softly, Brother Luke advised. Tis a good way into the city, even though its sounds and odors do seem to reach us here. It would be better to go pick a back and carry thy crosses most of the way. Thou'lt be glad of my old back ere we come to the Ludgate. I'll be bound. It was exciting to go back into the city, especially this midsummer eve. The doorways were decked with branches of green, birch, long fennel, and St. John's wort, some of the garlands of flowers, white lilies, and such like. Neighbor was merry with neighbor, and those who had wealth set out food and drink before their houses for all who passed by. Can we not stay even a little while? Robin begged. No, my son, when we have done our errands, we shall go back. The brace girdler down Leather Lane willingly gave Robin enough leather to cover the cross pieces of the crutches and hair to stuff it. Tis not fit to be sold, he said, being poorly dyed, but twill serve thy purpose. They were not far from Robin's home, but he had no wish to see it empty and deserted. How he wished it had been open and his father and mother there. And we'll call it a day there. Hope you're enjoying this story. Just uh, keep listening. The next one will come in the next video. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Bye-bye.